Good morning. I'm Diane Fischee. We'd like to welcome you to Flat Springs Baptist Church. Our focus today is on ministry and being a mentor. Those who have spiritually helped lead you and others to faith in God and have passed this torch. We're talking about passing a torch today as we minister to others. Who are we led to help? That will be our thought theme for today. And let us have a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our time together with you. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your forgiveness, your faithfulness, your grace, your word. You always keep your promises. Thank you for your son. Thank you for our salvation and so much more. We want to thank you for the mentors that have been given to us that help lead us to you. And may we also lead others to you and pass on your word. Amen. Ministry can be defined as caring for people in ways that are guided by the Spirit. And it involves transition sometimes. Our lesson text recounts the ministry between Elijah and Elisha. This reminds us of other transitions through the Bible. We might think of Moses to Joshua, from John the Baptist to Jesus, and of course Jesus to the church. Elijah and Elisha were prophets. They were called by God to speak to the people on his behalf. And these men, they reveal their humanity, their flaws, just like everybody else. And in this, we are reminded that God uses flawed people, including us, to accomplish His will. Our scripture today talks about the major transition between these two prophets. And it goes smoothly, but it is anything but ordinary. Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind to God while his protege watches in awe and in grief. And what a dramatic transfer this must have been. I tried to imagine it in my head and I just couldn't get my mind around it. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But think about it. Think about passing the torch of faith to this next generation and that is so important. And it not only goes to the next generation, they pass on what they have learned. Everything new, it builds on and continues what has come before. Whose ministry did we inherit? And who will be the heirs of, of our ministry? And I thought about that. I thought about the word mentor, which is wide counsel. And I thought about... Um, these mentors that, that we had as we were growing up. I thought about the ones that were in my life and in our church's life. Um, my spiritual mentoring, it began at home with a Christian influence of Mama and Granny and Granddaddy and of course from Flat Springs Baptist Church. We were very blessed at home because no harsh words were ever spoken. We were taught love. We were taught values. We were taught manners. We were taught respect for our family and for every other person. It was a time when your word and your handshake were bonding. I want my 60s back, <laughs> if you think about that. We were taken to church every Sunday. We were there Sunday nights, Wednesday night. We were there for training union, Bible school, whatever went on, we were there. We were taught the importance of what God has done for us, the value of our souls. Also, no lawns were mowed on Sunday. If you didn't go to church on Sunday morning, you didn't go anywhere else either that afternoon or that night. Granddaddy always said the blessing before we ate. Mama was always pleasant and she wrote poetry about people that had influenced her. And I've got a lot of, of poetry that she had written. My granny, 
she prayed for everyone. And if you don't have a gift for anything else, you can pray for people. But she did this. And I saw her sad on Sundays when her health was declining and she was unable to physically go to church anymore. She wanted so badly to go. And I had seen her so sad, almost to tears, as she watched on Sunday at the cars that would go by the driveway of the church and not turn in. She would say that she wanted to go, but she couldn't, and they could, and they wouldn't. And she would almost be in tears about that. I can still see, still see her sitting in her chair telling me this. The love in our home was not only expressed to our family, but to anyone who entered that house. They felt as though they were family. The visitors were always offered cake and pie. Granny always had something made just in case somebody came. It was always there. If you were sick, you got a phone call, you got food, but especially prayer. I thought about our church and the blessings received here. So many spiritual mentors that have passed on and those that still remain have helped to shape my spiritual journey and yours. And I'm only going to mention a few because there's so many. I don't want to leave anybody out, but I don't want to be here for a really long time. But if you grew up in Deep River and went to Flat Springs Baptist Church, you'll remember Miss Lona Luck. You'll remember James Bridges, Clarence Kelly, The Hedge Paths, Buey Shaver, Bible School Mentors, Some Memes, and all these other things. Christian examples and all these people and all of these events that shaped. What early mentors do you think about the ministry that they made an impression on you? What guidance comes to your mind? That's your thought for this afternoon and this week. Elijah was Elisha's mentor ministry, and today we're going to talk about a special bond between these two men, the ministry they shared, and passing it on. As far as the job description went, uh, serving as a prophet was about as rough as it got in ancient Israel. A prophet traveled constantly with little or no pay, and the benefits plan didn't kick in until after you passed away. Despite these drawbacks, many men and women, they answered the call to proclaim God's word to the people. And these people, as often as not, shown little inclination to hear it. But Elijah, after completing all these years of prophetic service, he knew that the time had come to pass along his loose cloak or his mantle to his protege, Elisha. Elisha had been a faithful friend and he was more than equipped to do this job. When Elijah attempted to persuade Elisha to stay behind for his final journey, the younger man refused. Like Elijah, Elisha, he was obedient to God. He was eager to follow the footsteps of his mentor. He was hungry for wanting to do God's will. And I, those words just jumped out at me that he was eager, he was wanting to obey, he wanted the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God was with him, and he was given the ability to perform miracles. The events we talk about today <clears throat> occur at the end of Elijah's life, and our scripture tells up front how the story will end. God will take Elijah to heaven through a whirlwind. And Elijah and Elisha are traveling toward that event. So while Elijah was on the run from Jezebel, God told him to anoint Elisha as his successor. So from that point on, Elisha became Elijah's servant and his protege. Our scripture text picks up at 2 Kings 2, 1 through 7. And when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, 
Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho, and the company of prophets were at Jericho. And they drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord would take your master out away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, and fifty men of the company of prophets, they also went, and they stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. These prophets seemed to view Elijah as their master also. Their question to Elisha indicates that they had the prophetic insight that this was going to happen, that Elijah would be taken away. And perhaps they shared Elisha's um, pain and his knowing that this departure was coming. Elisha knew, but he just didn't want to talk about it. His response was, yes, I know, keep silent. He's not snubbing them. Silence or stillness is a faithful response when one is faced with a monumental transition or decision. And I thought about times you just kind of want to be by yourself a minute. Just, just, just let me be. Soak it in. Elijah tries to get Elisha to remain in Gilgal, but he refuses. So they continue to Bethel. And the name Bethel, it means a house of God. And this was an important ancient worship site. Abraham had built an altar here when he first entered the land. It was at Bethel that Jacob had his dream about the ladder between earth and heaven. Bethel was one of the two locations where King Jeroboam the first established worship center there so they wouldn't have to travel to Jerusalem. And at Bethel, they encounter these prophets. It says it's possibly a school for prophets or a training center. So all these prophets were there with them. Elijah's next destination at the Lord's command was Jericho. And once again, he asked Elisha to stay behind. And he keeps asking this question, do you think it might have been a test for Elisha? But he knew God was taking Elijah away within hours, and he was the successor. If I were him, I would want him to be there every minute, every second that was left with my mentor. Elisha, he showed no signs of turning back from this calling. His insistence, it demonstrated that he was committed to accept this leadership. And again, in Jericho, they account encounter another company of prophets just like this other group they said do you know what's going to happen and of course he did so they were with them as they went to um, travel to the Jordan River the prophets go with them to say farewell to Israel's faithful prophet they would also witness this transfer of prophetic authority. And Elijah then, he performed his final miracle. He parted this Jordan with his mantle, which was his sleeveless outer garment. And he and Elisha could cross over on dry ground. This might remind us also of Moses when he parted the Red Sea so they could cross over to out of Egypt. It also might remind you of Joshua parting the Jordan River so the people could cross over. This repeated miracle, it assured the ones with them that God was with them. 
Our scripture picks up at 2 Kings 2, 8 through 10. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. So on the other side of the Jordan, Elijah asked, Is there anything else, any last request that you would have of me before I depart? So Elisha, he boldly asked for a double share of Elijah's spirit. Elijah was his spiritual father, so to speak, and Elisha was the heir, so to speak. So it was really a legitimate question. It was a really a really a legitimate request. He knew that he was going to have to have some extra divine power to enable him to do the task. He had some big shoes to fill. He simply wanted to be the man of God who would follow in Elijah's model. This humble request continued and Elisha was likely thinking of Deuteronomy 21.17 and that states that the firstborn son was entitled to a double portion of his father's estate. But even though this was a legitimate request, it wasn't Elijah's to grant. So he stated the condition um, that if you actually see me go and be taken by God, your request will be granted. So in one of the most dramatic scenes in the Bible, as they continued along their way, a chariot of fire pulled by horses of fire suddenly appeared, and Elijah climbed aboard and went up into heaven. Second Kings 2, 11 and 12. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. So when Elijah had passed from sight, Elisha tears his clothes, and that's a symbol of grief. Does, does this dramatic scene make you think of anything? It, it made me think of the rapture of the church, the dead in Christ shall rise, and the time of rapture, the believers are still alive, will be like Elijah and Enoch before him. They were called up to meet Jesus in the air. Possibly the experience of these men might have um, been intended by God to be sort of a dim foreshadowing of the rapture of the church in the day to come. That was kind of where my mind went. Unto that day, God has given us a ministry for each of us. God gives us the gifts and he gives us the call to use it. A mentor can guide us into carrying out our ministry. How has God equipped you? How are we passing on the spirit of ministry in our church and our community and our families? And I believe it starts at home. It starts in your family. How do we use what's been given us, whatever time we have, our money, our talents, abilities, opportunities? God makes it clear that what we do with what we have, it comes from our heart. He gives us the ability to accomplish what He has asked of each of us. A few years ago, um, I wrote something about um, gifts, uh, things you can do. Um, I believe what we do comes from our heart. 
It begins with our attitudes, and I wrote something about that. It's called Attitudes Are Contagious. Did you know that attitudes are contagious? A smile causes another smile. Laughter stimulates laughter. Quick tempers begin arguments. Whining turns friends and family off. Every action causes a chain reaction. Other people around you, they sense your mood by your expressions, your actions, your tone of voice. So let your attitude be a happy one. Be a positive influence, be an inspiration to someone, be an example with your words, your actions, your love, and your faith. A great attitude every day is, today I will make a difference. How can you do that? You give special gifts. What does that cost? No money is needed for that. The gifts are simple. Give the gifts of listening. Listen with care to a person needing a friend. Give a hug. Give encouragement. Give them a pat on the back. Tell someone they did a great job, whether it's in school or work or a play or whatever it was that you just witnessed and you enjoyed. Always say thank you. That's a gift of gratitude. Your gift of time is important. Spend time with those that you love. Let them know they're a blessing to you. Say a prayer for each one of them each night. Draw a picture, write a poem, send a card, make a craft, spread your talent. Today you share happiness with others. <clears throat> Brighten someone's day and make a difference. Attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? How do we use what's been given us? Whatever we have, time, money, talent, abilities, do it with your heart. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, you call us each day to be your light, your hands and your feet in this world. Show us the people and the places for whom our ministries are suited. Thank you for our mentors who model how to serve you. Help us to mentor others. Amen.